All right, sorry for the delay in starting here. Uh, so, the last lecture, we introduced this Excel-based numerical integration of dynamical systems. Uh, here, uh, so basically, we're implementing the same thing we did in the last one that had some ads to it a little bit by adding the depth outflow. But a lot of people kind of struggled a little bit on that. And uh, just to kind of get it fresh in the mind, and then today, uh, in the lecture, I'm going to actually sort of tell you how to do the rest of the assignment. So, um, and then, so it'll be still be the same assignment due on Sunday, but you're basically just going to paraphrase or put in your own words what we'll do here. And, um, but it's not all for free, then I'll give you a separate assignment, which is a slightly different system that you'll implement on your own in Excel. And then both of those are kind of part one and part two of this assignment. So you've seen the original problem, kind of struggled with it, hopefully sort of started to think about it, and then we'll solve on how to solve the whole thing. So you'll basically have a recipe for how to do the first assignment in this lecture, and then I'll give you a different assignment where um, you'll be simulating a slightly different system, but of similar complexity to this bacterial system so you can practice what you learned. So that's the kind of roadmap for today. Um, so, so from last time, we uh, so we're working with this bacterial example. We started with the banking example. We tried to turn the bacteria into a bank. So we know that uh, we know how to calculate compound interest. Um, and each year, you have a dollar. Um, after a year, you have a dollar plus a fraction, and then we know that we can take that dollar plus a fraction from one year, and we can put it in the balance of the next year, and then each one of those generates a little bit of a fraction, and then we take this uh, whole new amount, and it becomes the balance for the next year, and so on and so forth. And so we feel like we could generate an Excel spreadsheet that would simulate our bank balance over time, so our thought is, how do we take something that is a little more complicated than compound interest of the bank, so now we're talking about growth of bacteria, and turn it into a format where you use sort of the exact same setup to simulate this growth. So the thought was here, we have this more complicated system. Most systems in real life are gonna be specified kind of like this. You've got some initial state, one bacteria, and you've got something that changes that state. Now when you go out and try to look for information on Google about you know, how quickly things change, very often you'll just find these averages. We know that on average, if you wait W time units, let's say 0.75 seconds, you're going to get two bacteria from one bacteria on average. So some bacteria are going to double in less time, some bacteria are going to double in more time. So uh, the thought is here that I have some time instant where one bacteria goes to two, now, there could be some time period less than that where the next duplication events. There could be some time period less than that again where the next time period, uh, 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 the next duplication events. Or we could get a little wider than that when the next duplication events. And so this can go on and on, but all we know here is that on average, if we wait W time units, like 0.75 seconds, then our population is going to double. Um, or every bacteria in the population is going to have an opportunity to duplicate. Now those that duplicate are going to then start duplicating themselves, and that's why it's not quite so simple as to say the whole population doubles. The population might get much bigger than that out of this 0.75, but on average, if we look at every individual bacteria, you wait 0.75 seconds and you get a two bacteria from one. And so we are going to use this averaging approach. So, and again, this is a bacterial example, but you can use this for thinking about the growth of a population in Phoenix. If you know, on average, those, uh, you might say there's, um, you know, out of every 10 people, only five of them choose uh, to have kids. And of those five, it takes them a certain amount of time uh, before they're ready to have their first kid. So if you think about how many kids the group of 10 puts into the population and how long it takes for them to put into that population, you could come up with a similar story here. On average, every group of 10 people puts this many new offspring into the population after you wait an average of this amount of time. And that kind of smooths 
idea where we're gonna take something that in reality is very discreet and uh, seems very random and we're gonna smooth it out and make it deterministic just by playing with the averages. That's the type of simulation modeling we're doing here. So we do that in the bacterial case by taking this realistic scenario and then we've already added the averaging, which adds a little bit of unrealistic stuff, but it makes it closer to the model. And then we turn it into the banking account example, where we say that every, just like every dollar we view as kind of bleeding out partial dollars, then we say every bacteria is bleeding out partial bacteria, and it's bleeding out at a rate of one divided by the doubling rate. And so this gives us a rate unit that if we multiply by the number of bacteria, we find out how much of a flow we get into this new accumulation of bacteria. And if we only look at how much adds in a very small amount of time that we're gonna call DT, then basically we can calculate how many new non-reproducing bacteria are generated. And then when we move to the next time unit, we just take this new proportion we add it to the reproducing proportion, and then we do that over and over again. We need to do this with a very, very small time unit because while the bacteria are accumulating here in our model, in our spreadsheet, these new bacteria aren't reproducing. But in reality, they're in the population of bacteria, then eventually these bacteria reproduce. And so we don't want sort of a, a huge population of new bacteria that could be reproducing that aren't reproducing. That's why we only simulate this when we get a little bit of bacteria, and then we go to the next time step and then redo our interest calculation. So that's kind of the banking model <laughs> that we've got for, for why we're generating it this way. And so this is that, you know, just graphically what I just said there. We have a stock of bacteria, our bank balance. For everything on our bank balance, we need something like an interest rate to figure out how much our balance will increase to the next year. So we generate this flow, and we calibrate this flow to be similar to that doubling time that some biologist or microbiologist has told us. They, the biologists tell us that we know that every bacteria takes on average W time to double, and so we're gonna create a flow rate per bacteria of one over W. So if we take that flow rate, multiply it by the number of bacteria, and then multiply that by the, uh, the, the DT, then that gives us our interest. That gives us how much we're adding to the next balance. And then we'd redo that again. So I just took this interest, I added it to the balance, a new balance, and now both of them are generating at this same one over W rate that generates new interest and so on. So that's the basic structure of this simulator. And with it, we can then keep count. We have one bacteria in our balance, and then after we added the interest, we had this much bacteria, and then both of those started adding interest, and then we got that much bacteria, and so on and so forth, until we get this kind of exponential curve that we're expecting. Maybe you remember something like this from SOS 101, this exponential growth curve. And we, even though we didn't put in a formula for the exponential growth curve, th using this year by year compounding interest by compounding interest relationship, we're able to get that same formula out. And so if we zoom in on one of these intervals, then what we see is we have the stock, the number of bacteria at the beginning of the interval, and the number of bacteria at the end of the interval. And if we were to create a slope in between those, if this DT period is really, really small, then what we're doing is we're approximating the derivative of the population growth by this slope. Because that's all derivatives are. When, when the, the time distance gets really, really small, then a derivative, which is like a speed, it's like how quickly is the population growing at this instant? Well, rather than formally modeling how quickly it's growing, then I'm going to just approximate what it's going to be at this next time instant, and I'm going to do that by making a guess at what the speed is and just projecting forward as if the speed doesn't change during this whole interval. And that's why I need to make these DTs small, because in reality, in the continuum of population, then this stock is constantly changing through this whole period here. But if I make the DT really, really small, it's like the derivative doesn't change much. So I can just guess that if the derivative doesn't change much, then it's just a constant slope, and that tells me what it's gonna be over here. So this is where the calculus interfaces in what we're doing. When you are going to put in these flow expressions in the spreadsheet, 
We're not calling them derivatives formally, but that's what these flow expressions are, is that they are a way for us to put derivatives in, and we're actually modeling our bacterial growth by writing in formulas for the speed of the growth and then letting the spreadsheet add all those speeds up together and see what sort of population we get out. So that's what we started to do last time. We said, uh, okay, so we're gonna build a spreadsheet that models the growth of bacteria with this one over W flow rate. Now what I asked you to do in part two was to try to use what you learned from part one to add an outflow, to add a death rate. And what, and th this is what I'm gonna sort of show you how to do now, but what I'm hoping that you started to see is that the same logic here, this logic was that we get a, a birth event every W time units. And so we're gonna simulate that by multiplying the current number of bacteria by one over W to figure out what the flow of new bacteria is at any instant of time. The death is identical to that. We don't go down to like the third time unit in the simulation and then start changing the formula there. That's not what we wanna do. We want the same formula on every row of that spreadsheet from the first row all the way to the last row. And so we have to say at the first row, what's going on? Well, every bacteria we're saying on average goes through a death event every three time units. And so what we're gonna do is create an outflow column that looks just like the inflow column, but instead of multiplying the number of bacteria by one over W, we're gonna multiply the number of bacteria by one over three, where three, where W was 0.75 in your example, this is how long we wait until that bacteria doubles. And then three is how long that we wait until that bacteria sort of you know, vacuums up another bacteria, it gets rid of itself from the population. But in terms of flows, this is just two different types of flows, an inflow and an outflow, and we model them the same way. What's the average time until we expect the population to change? And that's what we'll see more concretely. So the net effect is that the flow is going to be not just the one over W flow that you had last time, but it'll be one over W minus one over three times the number of bacteria. So we're just, that's what's gonna be in your, when you're calculating the number of bacteria in the second row based on what's in the first row, it's gonna be that first row plus this times the number of bacteria from that first uh, row, and you're gonna fill that all the way down. And if you adjust the death rate, you're just gonna be adjusting the waiting time until death here. If you adjust the birth rate, you're gonna be adjusting it here but you only have to adjust it in one place. You don't have to manually go down and find that row of your spreadsheet and start to insert a new formula there. So let's see how that works. So this is the cartoon example of what we're implementing in the bacteria, or in the spreadsheet, is that we've got number of bacteria currently times one over W, number of bacteria currently times one over three. That's the inflow, that's the outflow. In our spreadsheet, we're going to add that minus that, and then that whole thing gets multiplied by our little DT time step to find out how much action happened in the tiny little time window. And then we take that little amount of interest and we add it or subtract it, whatever it is, it might end up being negative, to the, the balance, and that's how we get the trajectories all the way through. So that's our cartoon example, but um, I'm gonna now show you sort of on the spreadsheet what that looks like. So here's what we had last time, um, but I've added an L up here, where L is my length of lifetime. So before we had a DT, and we had W, where W is like waiting time until it, you produce a new bacteria. So now I've got L, which is like the waiting time until the lifetime ends. And just because to get us into this rate mindset, it turns out that for system dynamics modeling, it's just much easier to talk in terms of rate. So if you look up online, you're going to find data in terms of waiting time, how long until an event happens. But it's easier to convert that into how often does the event happen. And so in this case, we just do one over the birth rate, and that tells me how many new bacteria do I get per second per bacteria. So that's what I mean by rate. It's just one over these things. Similarly, I'm going to create a death rate, which will be one over L. So it's just a rate. How often do, so I get this many births per second per bacteria, this many deaths per second per bacteria. And with those two things together, I can now 
take the, the spreadsheet that you were working on last time, and I can add my outflow. So here's basically the spreadsheet you had before, but I added the L. Here's the birth rate and death rate, which are just one divided by these two things. And then I have a time column, which I start at zero, and every column I add my VT. That's what that dollar B, dollar one is. And then I move over. I start with one bacteria. You could start with 50, but we're just going to initialize at one. That's our initial condition. Here, I need to figure out the number of births. Well, that's just the current number of bacteria times the birth rate, which I defined up here. I then need to figure out the number of deaths. Same idea. Current number of bacteria times the death rate, which I have here. And now I have everything I need. Well, I need one more thing. And then how do I figure out the next number of bacteria? Well, it's just the previous number of bacteria plus VT times a sum of all the inflows minus the sum of all the outflows. And that's the formula I have here. Previous bacteria, DT, inflows minus outflows. And with all of that, if I fill down, then I will simulate a bacterial population with both birth and death. And up here, I can play with the birth rate and death rate and see how it changes the trajectories. I can get growth, I can get a constant population, and I can get a decline until zero. So that's what I would do here, and there's an example. So there are questions. I'll go back and, and here. Are there questions about this formulation, about anything that I said here, about why do we do it this way, or any questions from last time? Does it make sense that I'm turning? If it makes sense how I built the births, then it should make sense how I built the deaths. But it's totally reasonable if how I got the births is uh, is, is still unclear. So are there any questions about any of that, any of these formulas? Yeah. Could you just get rid of flow at the end of bacteria? Like for the first part of the question, could you just leave it to flow, or would that be something that could fix? Um, the flow, uh, for the, the first question, that's like getting rid of the death uh, column. The first question was just to reproduce what we did last time. And last time we didn't have deaths. And you could simulate uh, getting rid of the deaths column by making this L gigantic. Like if you put this as like 9 million or something here, then basically the death rate would go to zero. And it'd be like zeroing out this column. Or you could just remove this column from the formula here, and then you would get the same thing you implemented last time on Tuesday. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Why is the second one birth is zero? Ah, because um, if I go back to this column, how I do my time, every time step is VT wide. And so I start at time zero, so the next time step waits 0.01, and that's why it becomes 0.01, becomes 0.01 here. If I, as I fill down, so if I go to the spot after I've filled down through these, then I see 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, and each one of these are 0.01. So in the assignment, I ask you to simulate this up through five time units and call them five seconds. If you change your DT, then like if you make this really small, then if you don't change the number of rows, then your plot might end like at 1.5. And so in that case, you need to fill out the number of rows so that you get enough rows to go back out to five. Are those actually the rates? rates. Uh, that's right. They, they go, they, so you can think of these as uh, per bacteria rates, like per capita rates. And these are population level rates. So you're taking the per bacteria rates, multiplying by the number of bacteria, and getting the actual change in the population over time. Yeah, so I said births and deaths. This really probably should say birth rates, death rate. Um, I think when I made these slides, I didn't want it to be confused with this, and I also didn't want this to be super long and say like birth rate per bacteria. 
Are there any other questions about this? Okay. So then the third question on that says, what happens when you change dt? So here is my original dt, a dt of 0.01. And notice that it starts at 0. And it, at time 5, it goes all the way up to 140-something, like 147 or something like that. If I make my dt much smaller, and I have to increase the number of rows, and, uh, but I get basically the same curve out. Notice it's not quite as chunky. There's like steps that you can see here. And because I've made my dt, I've basically cut it, uh, divided it by 100, so my dt is really small. Then you can't see these chunky steps anymore, so you get a nice smooth line, but it still starts at around 0, 1, and it goes to about 147. So that implies to me that 0.01 was probably a good dt to choose. But maybe I want to try a higher dt than that. So I might go to point, uh, all the way to 1. So now I've got a dt of 1. And so now I get this plot. Now you can see, if you look closely, there are little corners here every one second. So if I, you see that it's hard to see here, but there's kind of a little corner there. There's a much more evident corner here, much more evident corner here, and here, and so on. And that's because. Um, these are the only spots where we're updating our population approximation. The blue line in between them, that's just Excel connecting the dots. And so in this case, we are, I'm taking the gambit by choosing dt equal 1 that I can assume that basically nothing happens in one second. And so I can take the number of bacteria at one second, calculate how many bacteria will be generated in a second, add that and jump all the way to two seconds. But if I generate a lot of bacteria in one second, then they would have reproduced themselves during that interval. And I'm missing out on that. And that's because, and that ends up being the reason why, if I look here, after five seconds, I am at a much lower population count than I am for the other DT. So basically, by, tr by taking the, the chance that, by trying to, to simulate quicker. So here, there's basically only five rows. One, two, three, four, five, and then six. So this is the, our initial conditions and then five calculated rows. I tried to get away with only using five rows of my Excel spreadsheet, but it turns out that that's probably just too coarse because I'm jumping over so many things, I'm just assuming they're not actually happening that my bacterial growth ends up not being uh, where it should be. And so, and that's, now if I would have changed my birth rate or my death rate to be much, much faster, then eventually I would get the same problem with this one. So that's the idea is you have to choose your DT's values to be basically much smaller than the time scale of your system. And the fastest thing that happens in our system is the birth rate at 0.75 time units. So because the birth rate takes less than a second, then it's really important for me to not try to simulate over the birth rate because I'm going to miss a bunch of births. And that's the reason why these two look the same, but this one looks different. So we want to make our DT as large as possible, but we want to make it small enough that uh, you end up not getting this giant change from here to there. So any questions about that, this idea of making the DT too big? And that's the third question on that is, can you generate at least three of these graphs that demonstrate this and then say in words to me what's going on? So then paraphrase to me in your own words of how to choose a good DT and what the, what the problem might be by choosing too large of a DT. Well, I, want it, I, I don't exactly know how much smaller. That's hard to say because especially when these systems get really complicated, but effectively that's it, is that I want the DT to be sufficiently small that if I made it any smaller, I wouldn't get any change in the curve, but as large as possible. So if I make it this large, it's bad because if I make it a little smaller, I get a very different plot. But there's no reason for these settings for me to make it this much smaller 
because this curve is basically identical to this curve. Okay. Are there any other questions about that? All right, good. Well, so then that, um, so yeah, so this is just the, exactly what I said here, finding the right DT, too large and your simulation's inaccurate, too small and your simulation takes too long. So that's the balance of those two things. And then these are, so any other questions? That was all of that first assignment that we did on Tuesday. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, it might be. So if you just have a, a straight, you're saying the same data. Um, right. So so there's a question here. So I, I just generated, I, I used the same formula as you did, but when I filled down, I got a straight line and not an exponential. And the reason that's happening in your case is that if you look at your time, you're only filling down to like 0.004. And so you're simulating this tiny little bit here. It's zooming in on that. And so it looks flat. If you continue to fill down so that until this time column says five, you should get that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Looks like, okay. So when you said five, I thought you meant point zero five. Yeah, so that's a good question. When I say five in the assignment, I don't mean five steps. I mean five time units, and by time units, I mean I didn't give you a time unit, but I mean like seconds or hours or minutes. So whatever time unit is being expressed here, I want you to go to five, not five steps. So all the way down to the number five. So this might go down 5,000 lines until you get to number five, but I want you to have this go all the way until that reads five. All right, any other questions? All right, so um, this is basically a summary of what we've been doing. We're gonna be, next week, we actually go into drawing these in this form, uh, where this form, uh, this is the stock column, this is the flow column, these are any auxiliary columns you put to help you do the calculations. Uh, but what you're doing when you write these stock and flow models is the equivalent of this integration problem up here. So the formulas you put into flow if you were to then take them and integrate like you do in 211 and get something out and then plot this thing, it should match the thing that comes out of the Excel spreadsheet. So this is our shortcut to getting that without ever having to actually go through the calculus. That's what these numerical simulations are doing. And so this here is how I would draw this in those stock and flow diagrams we're gonna learn more about next week. Um, so I've got a bacteria stock, I've got an inflow of birth, there's a birth rate and an average time to reproduction, there's a death rate and an average lifetime. This is the stock and flow version of the spreadsheet that you just saw implemented over here. And that is the calculus based in a, a differential equation, but all three of these things are identical. But we're trying to get to the solution of this without having to do the integration and this is still tedious. So you start here, you gotta walk before you can run. But when we run, then we get to draw them out and this is much, much easier than dealing with any of this stuff. And yet, this will give us the exact same curves that we would get if we solved this thing by hand. So that's where we're going. All right, so any questions about that before we go to the, the next assignment here? So the new assignment, now that I've done the first assignment for you, is a simpler, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, it's equally simple, but it's a very different context. So you're basically building a spreadsheet modeling how water fills in the back of a toilet. So you assume that you just flushed a toilet and the water level is zero centimeters above the bottom of the toilet. There's a target water level of 15 centimeters and you have got a flow which is regulated by the valve in the toilet which gradually gets slower as you get closer to the target. So initially, it's a full, um, you know, whatever this, it's proportional to the, the, the height. Of the, and so it's initially 15 centimeters, but as you get closer to the target, then it goes closer and closer to zero and eventually shuts off. So you're gonna simulate this using an Excel spreadsheet. You're gonna plot the water level as it changes over time, and that's gonna require you to choose a sufficiently small DT be a good approximation. 
Make sure you label things with titles and units, like seconds and centimeters. And then again, show at least five seconds worth of data from this simulation. Um, submit it within a Word document, also submit your spreadsheet, um, and then show me a uh, causal loop diagram uh, showing this, and it is a hint, it should be a balancing feedback loop. It should be a relatively simple loop, similar to the other balancing feedback loops we show up, a single loop, and then I've added extra credit, if you'd like to do it, where you can complete this first part again, but add a leak, and that's equivalent to like adding a death rate. And so if the toilet is leaking, then how does that change the level at which it settles out at. And, um, and so describe whether you think uh, it's approaching the same level as it was without the leak. So that's just for extra credit here. So that's basically, you know, this is basically implementing this example, but with a toilet instead of a bucket of water. And so there's our toilet. We've got a target level coming in. That's setting up the flow. We've got a water level here. So this is going to be in the flow column of your spreadsheet. This is going to be in the stock level column of your spreadsheet. You can put this as a parameter up top, just like the kind of birth rate. And, um, and that's it right there. That's it kind of symbolically. And that's the formula you'll put in that flow column. That's maybe you know, what's going to be in the stock. And so you'll implement it in this way. So you'll have the water level is going to be a stock column. The valve flow is going to be a flow column. If you need any extra columns, you can add them in as converters. And then you'll simulate that down. So that's this assignment, which is, uh, you know, I'll help you with because we're going to start that now. Are there any questions about the, this toilet bowl example implementing it in Excel? The formulas, I think, are going to be a little simpler than the bacterial ones because there's less multiplication going on to worry about. Okay. So looking forward, um, think about start reading this chapter three. That'll be uh, due basically in a week. Uh, again, I mentioned it last time, start forming your final project teams. Uh, it would be a good idea to build a, get an Insight Maker account unless you really like Vinsim. You can use Vinsim as well for all the Insight Maker stuff. And uh, we'll go over how to use both. And then assignments for this week, there's these assignments D1 and D2 are kind of like part one and part two. All of the solutions for D1 are in this lecture, so I'm just asking you to parrot them back to me in your own words. And then D2 is your opportunity to practice what you learned from D1 to implement this simulation of a toilet, and we'll use the balance of the class, and I'm happy to help you get started with that. And so that's what we're gonna do. Uh, midterms coming up after lecture D4, so basically after Thursday of next week, we'll get a weekend, and then the Tuesday we'll have a review lecture in class, and then that Thursday you'll have the first sh uh, bite at the midterm. Then you'll go over the weekend, and you should get your scores back by the end of the weekend if the library goes quick enough, and then that upcoming Tuesday there's a retake, and it'll be a slightly different midterm, but same number of questions, same difficulty, um, and then the Thursday of that week, which is right before finals week, we start lecture E1. Um, so if those of you are okay with, you know, taking that as one of your misses, you can feel free. We've got no assignments like uh, that are due in class that day. And uh, then you'll go off to spring break and you'll come back and we'll keep going with unit E. So that's, um, that's where we're going with that. So any, uh, any questions? If not, then we'll do the attendance exercise and we'll do the toilet assignment, uh, which we can work on until the remainder of class. Question? Yeah. What's the date of the um, if, if you go on the, I don't, I don't want to say the wrong date. If you go on the Canvas and look under the course um, uh, information module, there's like a tentative schedule. And if you click on that PDF, it has a date of all the lectures and the midterm and the midterm retake. Any other questions? Uh, the attendance exercise today is um, the attendance exercise for Tuesday. I asked you what the derivative was. Was it a stock flow or a converter? And the right answer to that one was that it was a flow. So, um, so my question was in the bacterial example, what is the what role do the bacteria play? Are they the stock, the flow, or the converter? And so the question is, in the bacteria example, 
Are the bacteria the stop, the slow, or the conversion?
question of how the water level is going to flow. Mm -hmm. um, also, as we get rid of the problems we don't need on the lake, we need to think of like you know water level, water flow, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, like those are class two. These are three days, slow one all the way into class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, you can you can right click on class.